Uh, so we talked about last time this idea of a continuous spectrum, a black body spectrum that is emitted from any hot source, right? This isn't due to atomic transitions. This is light that is uh, produced by a hot object according to its temperature. But if this light from a continuous spectrum passes through a cool gas, and it needs to be a cool gas so that they're not in it, uh, so that the atoms are not in an excited state, then the continuous spectrum can uh, excite some of those atoms. And as those get excited, they absorb those photons in you know, the, the exact colors based on the atomic energy structure. And so those specific wavelengths are then removed from the continuous spectrum because they're absorbed by the atoms. And if we thought about, you know, the, the same atoms in the gas could produce if they, it was heated until it glowed, basically the emission spectrum, that's the, you know, photo negative of the absorption spectrum. So all of the frequencies that are missing from the absorption spectrum because of those atomic transitions would match the emission spectrum frequencies for that same gas if it was heated. Um, let's say that we have a small star that has no atmosphere. What type of spectrum would we see from that star? All right, so if you answered either B, black body, or C, continuous, then both of those are actually correct. So um, it may seem weird, but even though we think of stars as balls of gas, they're not generating emission spectra directly. It's not the same as having a bunch of discrete atoms producing a bunch of discrete colors. Instead, a star is more like a, uh, you know, hot coil on your stovetop that produces a continuous spectrum according to its temperature. So in other words, um, a star without its atmosphere is a black body that creates a continuous spectrum. And there's two ways to represent this continuous spectrum. Uh, we've seen both of them now. One of them is kind of this, you know, representation of what that light would look like if passed through a prism. And so when I say spectrum in general, that's kind of what I mean. But uh, we can also think about the black body curve of that black body where we're looking at the energy with respect to wavelength. Both of those representations are the same. But um, when we look at kind of the rainbow color spectra, it doesn't really tell us the information about where in the spectrum the energy output is the highest. I guess we could you know, map that onto that spectrum. But in general, uh, that's not easy information to get from just looking at the light passed through a prism. So that's why both of these representations are important because they are like telling us the same thing, but one of them in a kind of a shorthand kind of barcode style. And the other one gives us more detailed information, which you have to think about a little harder because it's in the form of a graph. All right. So let me ask you this now, let's say that um, we're looking at the same star, but half a year later, so we're in a different part of our orbit around the sun, and now there's a uh, gas cloud in space that's between Earth and the star that we're observing. In this case, what is the type of spectrum that we would detect? Okay, I'm seeing the most votes for A that we would see an absorption spectrum, and that's exactly right. So if this is a cool gas, then the continuous spectrum as it passes through the gas is going to excite some of the atoms within. Um, those atoms are going to absorb those colors and those are going to be removed from our continuous spectrum. Uh, we can look at the same idea represented in our black body curve. Um, if we just take the black body curve and then cut out notches of light that's missing. But you'll notice that when there's um, these dark bands in our absorption spectra, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the light at that wavelength is missing from the black body curve. Actually, it's probably not all missing from the black body curve. And instead, um, some of that light is still getting through, only some of it is being removed. And I don't have an illustration of exactly how this works on the slide, but uh, when an atom absorbs the um, photon, then it will briefly be in an excited state, but spontaneously, and usually very soon, it will drop back down to a lower energy state and emit that same color of photon. When an atom emits light, it emits in generally all directions. And so when the entire gas cloud absorbs light, it re-emits those same colors in all directions. So some of the light that was coming toward our telescope in the first case is now scattered like out to the side and backwards um, and so the part that was originally going forward is the part that's missing. 
So that's not all of the light, but it's some of it. In case you were wondering, like the, the, that absorbed light didn't just disappear. It got re-emitted in a different direction. All right, we can actually see exactly how this looks when we look at the, um, the spectrum of the sun. So this is the predicted black body curve of the sun. If we just think about what is the temperature of the solar surface and model the black body curve, this is what we get. Um, and if we have no solar atmosphere, then we just see a nice smooth black body curve. But when we actually measure the sun's spectrum from space, um, we get this shape, which is full of these little notches. So my question for you in the chat is, um, what is the texture in this curve coming from? So why is some of the light missing from the model in what we actually measure? Take about a minute and type your answer into the chat, but don't hit send yet. Um, it turns out that this is due to the atmosphere of the sun itself. So if you think of, this, of a star, we haven't talked about this, so don't worry about it if this did not occur to you. If we think of a star as being a kind of atmosphere of cooler gas surrounding a core of basically hot, uh, dense gas, then the hot, dense gas produces a continuous spectrum like the blue curve we see. And then the uh, atmosphere of the star itself absorbs some of that continuous spectrum to um, result in an absorption spectrum, which is what we're seeing in this kind of jaggedy curve. So all of this missing light is being absorbed by different atoms in the sun's atmosphere. And it's by looking at the absorption features in this curve that we figured out exactly what the sun is composed of. So um, this is basically what a stellar spectrum looks like if you pass the, all the light through a prism and then stretch it out far enough so that you're seeing all the details and then chop it up and stack it on top of each other so that uh, it's manageable to look at, then this is what we get. And um, all these dark bands are absorption lines made by specific atoms. Some bands are very faint and narrow while other absorption bands are very dark and wide. And we call the darker and wider bands um, stronger. Um, and in general, we can go through and figure out the, um, I guess the frequencies of all of these lines and their strengths. And by doing so, figure out what the composition is of the gas that we're looking at. So um, for those of you who said maybe that the sun's spectrum was missing some frequencies because it passes through Earth's atmosphere. That's also true. So this red curve is what the solar spectrum looks from the ground. And uh, the absorption features here that are particularly important are an ozone feature out in ultraviolet, which I think all of us are grateful for because it prevents damaging UV radiation from being even stronger on the ground. Um, there's an oxygen feature out here in the near infrared. And then farther out in the infrared, there are these three really big uh, wide dips. Those are all from water vapor. And then there's one more big dip in the infrared out here from carbon dioxide. So by looking at the uh, absorption features that we measure on the ground versus from space, we can also get a really good idea of Earth's atmospheric composition. 